Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this talk. Uh, my name is Bob Bell. I'm a distinguished member of the technical staff with Dell, where I work uh, for a 10,000 member um, engineering organization in DevOps. We're uh, uh, blessed to have uh, Meta Atomel coming with us, uh, being with us here today uh, to give his presentation. Uh, Meta is a developer advocate at Google where he's focused on helping developers, uh, particularly with Google Cloud. Um, he's been with Microsoft and Skype and Adobe before, uh, and also EMC, um, which is now part of Dell. And so, although I did not know him there, uh, we overlapped a, a small bit. Uh, his speech today is titled Choreography versus Orchestration in Serverless Microservices. Um, it's one that's of interest to me. I'm going to be interested in listening to the talk. I think that there's some things uh, here in common with what we're doing here at Dell. Um, and so I'm interested in hearing, and I'm wondering, uh, Meta, if you could share who you think should be interested in hearing this talk as well. Yes. Uh, so first of all, thanks a lot for the introduction. And it's great to see that someone from EMC, because EMC was my first job out of college back in when I was in the U.S., and I worked there for like a year or so. So it reminded me a lot of good things about that place. Uh, so great to connect. Uh, yeah, so my talk, um, it's mainly about how do you organize microservices? You know, how do you organize them? How do you get them cooperate uh, to do what you want them to do? So anyone who's working in microservices and anyone who's trying to you know, build microservices, architect microservices, and also struggling with like, you know, how do I organize them? How do I make them work for common good? I, I think would find this uh, interesting. Uh, so software engineers, uh, software architects, uh, even even DevOps people as well, because you know, when you're maintaining microservices, how you organize has a lot of implications for DevOps as well. So I think a lot of people hopefully will find it interesting. But that's awesome. As I mentioned, I'm really encouraged. I hope our our audience is excited for uh, this as well. And so uh, if you're ready, why don't you go ahead and begin the presentation? Yes. OK. So hello, everyone. Uh, as Bob said, my name is Matata Tamel. Um, I'm a developer advocate at Google. I'm based in London. Um, I don't know where you are, but I love these online events because, it, the, well, the thing is, I miss the in-person events. But the online, the good thing about the online events is that you get to meet, uh, sync with people that you wouldn't normally sync. So wherever you are, uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, so today's talk, uh, what I want to do is that first, I want to explain to you what I mean by choreography, what I mean by orchestration, and I want to kind of compare and contrast them and kind of give you an idea on when choreography makes sense, when orchestration makes sense, and what are the pros and cons. So it will be a little introduction at the beginning. Then I want to look at uh, the landscape in this area. So if you want to build a choreography architecture, what kind of tools exist? If you want to build an orchestration um, kind of architecture, what kind of tools exist? Uh, and just, just to give you a, a kind of some names of some services that you might want to look into. But I won't get into too much detail. I just want to set the landscape a little bit and then do a little bit of comparison between different cloud providers or what kind of things they provide, uh, especially with orchestration. Then I want to zoom into orchestration and talk about Google's Google Cloud's orchestration service workflows. And my point of doing this is not to sell Google, Google Cloud um, workflows or anything like that, but rather show you what kind of things you can expect from an orchestration service, right? So I'm kind of using that as a as kind of like a, a example of an orchestration service and what kind of things you can expect and how do you define your orchestration and, and all that kind of stuff. So hopefully it will be useful even if you are not using Google Cloud uh, because even if you are using some other service, the concepts are, are pretty much the same. And then finally, in the, in the last part of the talk, I'm gonna talk about a case study. So me and one of my coworkers, uh, Guillaume Laforge, uh, we wrote this application initially using the choreography approach. Uh, it was an event-driven kind of application and later we rewrote it using orchestration. Um, and then, you know, in that transformation, we kind of learned a lot of things along the way. So I want to talk about that application, how it was before, how it is after, and what we learned along the way so that you can really see like what it, what it means to build something using choreography and what it means to build something using orchestration 
and pros and cons through a case study. So I think that's like the most interesting part of the talk. But before we get to the case study, I want to first make sure that we have the context so that we can really understand what's happening with the case study. And if and I'm sure you will have questions, so please take a note. And at the, after the, the talk, we'll have a Q&A session. So I'll be happy to answer questions in detail there. All right, so let's get started. So let's first start with choreography versus orchestration, what we mean by these. Now, I want to explain um, choreography and orchestration with a simple use case. Um, so let's imagine you have an e-commerce application. And in this e-commerce application, you need to design an e-commerce transaction. Now, as you know, um, in e-commerce kind of applications, you usually receive requests from people. Then once you receive the request, you need to authorize and charge the credit card or the user. Then once the credit card is charged, um, you probably want to get the shipping ready. Uh, so you want to prepare and ship. And finally, you want to notify the user that you know, their item has shipped, right? So of course, I'm simplifying here uh, grossly uh, because um, you know, in a real e-commerce kind of app, there's much more steps than this, but I'm just simplifying just to make my point here. So if you need to design this e-commerce transaction, now, how do you do it? Uh, one easy way of doing this, uh, and that's what we used to do back in the day, is just to put, put these um, use cases, like, or like, I should say put these like different parts of the transaction into a single service and deploy it as a single service, as a single monolith, and just run it that way, right? So that would be really easy, and that's what we used to do. But you know, these monolithic applications, they have a lot of problems um, in terms of, um, you know, maintenance and in, in, in terms of um, how they're deployed, um, how they're scaled. So I'm, I'm not going to get into details of why we shouldn't do monoliths. I'm sure at, at this point, everyone knows what, what that is. So we, we've been kind of trying to break down this single monolithic applications into what's called microservices. So what we can do is that instead of a single monolithic uh, um, service, we can break down uh, that into multiple services that do the distinct parts of the transaction. So for example, and this is an example from Google Cloud because that's what I know, but this applies to any cloud provider. Um, you would probably have a front end that handles the requests coming in. Uh, on Google Cloud, this would be App Engine. Then you would have a payment processor to deal with the credit cards and payments and stuff like that. Then you might have a shipper function to deal with the details of shipping. And finally, the notifier would actually do the notification, sending the email, things like that. And an easy thing to do is you can have each service calling the next service in the chain. So the, the front end will receive the request and call the payment processor. The payment processor will call the shipper, so on and so forth, right? So I call this services calling each other directly kind of model, right? Now, what are the pros and cons of this simple REST-based rest approach? Uh, first, the pros is that we already you know, broke down the monolith, right? So we are not dealing with a single monolith, monolith application. We are dealing with microservices that are self-contained, that can be scaled independently, that can be deployed independently. So all the benefits of microservices we already have, so that's good. Secondly, um, this model is very easy to implement, right? So all you need to do is that a service needs to know what service is in, in the next ch chain and just call that service. That's it. So it's, this is easy to implement, easy to reason about. There's not much complexity to it, really. Now, these are the pros. Uh, on the other hand, the cons is that you are already having a lot of coupling between your services. So now your front end has to know about the payment processor. And the payment processor has to know about the, um, the, the shipping function, so on and so forth. So the, this creates a lot of coupling that you don't really need. You know, the front end doesn't really need to know about the next service in the chain. And this coupling has produces many more issues, right? So because each service needs to know the next service in the chain, Every time you need to change a service, you need to think about what's before it and what's after it and things like that. So this coupling is already not so great. Secondly, um, in this transaction, um, in the simplified transaction, we had you know, four services. And if any of the services fail, then the, the whole transaction kind of fails. So each service is, in a way, it's a single point of, um, 
single point of failure. Then, um, you know, if you want to kind of um, prevent this single point of failure, you want to probably implement some kind of error, retry, or timeout logic in your services. So, for example, if the front end calls the next service in the chain, and if the service is not responding, it probably wants to call again um, with a number of times, um, but it wants to probably do that not too often, maybe wait a little bit. So that logic has to be implemented, uh, and you need to do that in each service if you want to have a resilient kind of transaction. And for me, the biggest problem is that uh, who ensures that the whole transaction is successful, right? So each service can try its best to do its part, but there's nothing like kind of watching the whole transaction and making sure that the whole transaction is actually successful. And that, and that's a big problem, um, especially in an e-commerce kind of application. You don't want to drop requests or or don't do don't finish the transaction completely, right? So what can you do to get rid of some of these problems? Well, one thing that you can do is uh, you can use what's called choreography, also known as event-driven kind of architecture. So in this architecture, um, the services, instead of calling each other, they all they need to worry about is, you know, send messages and receive messages from a message broker. So you have this backbone uh, called message broker in your system. And depending on which cloud you are, you, you're going to be using a different service. But at the end of the day, there's basically a messaging kind of backbone in, in your architecture. And the front end will probably still receive the, the request over HTTP. Then instead of calling the next service, it will create a new message. Uh, maybe it's called the order, uh, new order kind of message. And it will send that to the message broker. So it doesn't know that there's a service um, like payment process or ship or anything like that. It will just say, okay, I received this request and I'm just going to announce that to the whole world and it will send it to the message broker. The message broker has the rules to route messages. So it will know that it will route this new order request message to payment processor because that's what payment processor has said they were interested in. Then the payment processor will pick that up, do its bit, and then it will emit another message type. Now, this time the message type would be something like, you know, the payment process for this order or something like that. So you can see how this works. Um, these services are loosely coupled in the sense that they don't know about each other. Um, all they do know is the messages that they're interested in and the messages that they might emit uh, to let other ones know that they did their bit, okay? Uh, and this, this is, by the way, it's, it's an event-driven architecture because we have different events fly, flying the system. Um, it's also called choreography because you know, each service is doing its own bit. You know, there's no, no like some no central orchestrator or anything like that. They're all kind of acting on their own. So that's why it's called choreography. Now, the pros and cons of this approach is that, first of all, your services are loosely coupled. They don't know about each other, and that's great. Secondly, each service can be changed, scaled independently. So if you need to change, for example, the payment processor, you don't need to worry about like who's before or who's after, right? There's no actually, there's no order of things. Uh, all you need to worry about is that service um, uh, deploy a new version and, that, and that's it. Like everything just works uh, without having to worry about other services too much. You don't have a single point of failure um, in the sense that, you know, if one of the services, like let's say it's not working, the rest of the services will still receive and emit messages, right? So that so the, the system still kind of works. But of course, your transaction uh, might not work because there's a service that's not doing its bit. But at least the rest of the things could work. So maybe that, that will be useful in some use cases. And events in general, uh, they're very useful if you want to extend your system. So in an event-driven architecture, if you want to add a new service, you deploy the service and, all, and you just configure um, what kind of messages that service is interested in, and that's it. Again, it, it becomes really easy to add something because you don't need to change too much outside the service. Whereas in orchestration, we'll see later, you need to do more to extend your system. So if you feel like you have an architecture where things might change and you need to add more services going forward, then maybe choreography and event-driven is something you should think about because that will make uh, your system more easily changeable and extendable. Now, on the other hand, the cons is that now 
now it will be difficult to monitor your system. And the reason for this is that you're going to have these services receiving different types of events and sending different types of events. Okay, and there will be multiple event types. And if something fails in your system, it won't be so easy to see what failed, right? You will probably see that the transaction um, is, is didn't complete properly, but you won't necessarily know right away it, where in your transaction, which service um, failed. You need to, usually what you need to do is that you need to kind of see the logs, kind of trace your events, and usually your events will have a, a correlation ID so you can correlate different events in a transaction. And then once, the, once you kind of figure out which service might be not working, then you need to look into the logs of that service and then kind of figure out whether that service failed or not. Uh, whereas in orchestration that we'll see later, the monitoring is much easier than, uh, than choreography. So that monitoring becomes difficult. Um, the errors, retries, and time, timeouts, they're still an issue. So if something um, failed with, within a service, then um, you know maybe if the service couldn't send a message or something like that, uh, for example, you need to kind of have that logic to resend that message. Uh, or if the, if the service received that message that's not formed correctly, then you need to have that logic to, to decide what to do. So these things, they are still your problem. And the business flow, right? Um, so the the architecture of your system is not captured anywhere in, in event-driven systems, right? Um, you know, we can we can look at the flowchart of our system, uh, and we can we can kind of say this is how it should work. But when you take that and change it to an event-driven kind of system, you kind of lose that business flow. And I'm going to show an example in the next slide uh, what I mean by that. But that business flow uh, is almost is kind of like a side effect of your event-driven architecture instead of the central piece that you want to kind of um, capture and maintain. And this problem of who ensures the whole transaction is successful is still a problem. So even though you made things more loosely coupled, even though you know there's no single point of failure and there, things are easy to extend and all that kind of stuff, you still have this fundamental problem of you know, how do I ensure that my transaction is actually completed and is successful? And in a real world kind of application, you probably have this kind of architecture, right? I mean, my simple uh, e-commerce transaction is, is very simplistic, uh, but in a real world, you probably need to read a DB, um, then you need to probably check the stock um, and do different things depending on if something is in stock or not. If something is not in stock, you probably want to uh, if you want to like maybe call a third party API to order it for the user, uh, then you want to update your DB again, and maybe you want to notify the user using external service. So this is more um, kind of more like what you would do uh, in a real world. So now imagine this flowchart taking this and trying to implement this using microservices and using an event driven kind of architecture. It can be done, uh, but it won't be so easy. It won't be like you know straightforward to take this and kind of um, break it into services. So it's not so easy to see like okay, which one should be a service, um, and then which events do you emit, uh, and then even if you do it, you kind of lose this flowchart, right? I mean, this flowchart, even though it's a com complex transaction, it's it's very easy to understand what's supposed to happen. You, you can trace through it, right? Uh, but once you take this and change it to event-driven, you kind of lose this information. Uh, and I think that's a shame because why, why lose this very useful information um, if you can kind of capture it somehow, right? Now, okay, so what can we do? Well, the next thing that we can try is what's called orchestration. And the idea of the orchestration is that um, you, you have an external service, an, an orchestrator that will orchestrate the calls in the order that you want um, and make sure that those, those calls are successful and make sure that the, the right parameters are passed into services and so on and so forth. So maybe you still have a front end. So the, you, you, the front end will still receive the requests from the users, but then the front end will simply just kickstart an orchestration. And this orchestration uh, is defined in an orchestrator. So you you define what that orchestration is ahead of time. And I'm going to show you examples of this later. 
And then this orchestrator will make the call to the payment processor um, with the order details. Then it will get the result back. Then with that result, it will call the shipper and, and then it will get the, get the result from the shipper and so on and so forth. So the orchestrator is the one making the calls. The services don't know about each other. They don't call each other. Services, they don't receive messages. They don't emit messages. So they just sit there and wait for the orchestrator to call them. And orchestrator is the one like directing this whole traffic. I mean, the front end starts it, but the orchestrator is the one that's kind of orchestrating the rest of the calls. Now, the pros and cons of this orchestration approach is that, uh, first of all, since you have an orchestrator, you can actually capture that business flow that I show you um, in a central place. So the orchestrator will, will have this orchestration definition, and this business flow will be captured there. And since it can be captured, um, it can be source controlled, it can be versioned. So there's a lot of good things that comes out of this, right? Uh, now there's a place you can say, go and say, okay, this is my, this is how things are supposed to work. And this is how things are supposed to flow in my system. And if there's a problem in, in that flow, you can create a new one with a new version, and then you can check into your source control, you know, um, and you can see how system evolved. So there's a lot of benefits of, of this. Secondly, uh, in orchestrate, orchestrator, there's this notion of steps. So um, there's each step, and then you define what happens in each step. And because of this step idea, if something fails, it's, it's very easy to see what failed because you will see that, you know, I ran this step, it was okay, then I ran this step, but then it failed. So you know right away that this is, this, this is the part of the call that failed, and you can zoom in and see, okay, what, what am I doing in this step? Just look at the step. Oh, I'm calling this microservice. Okay, let me go to that microservice, check the logs, you know? Uh, compared to event-driven uh, architecture, it becomes really easy to see when things fail. Now, these errors, retries, and timeouts, you still need to think about them because you know, the services can fail. But you can kind of centralize them a little bit because the orchestrator, um, depending on which orchestrator you use, but at least the ones that, that I'm going to show, is that you, they can have these uh, errors and retries around each step, and you can define them in the orchestration instead of in each service. So instead of each service having to do these um, error and retry kind of policies, you can have orchestrator applying them in a consistent way. And services are still independent, right? So we are not deploying a single monolithic application. Um, we are still deploying microservices. But I think what, what I call an orchestration is that um, we are kind of putting together a temporary monolith in a, in a way, right? So we are defining how things sh should go together in an orchestration, and, and we are deploying that. But the services themselves are still independent. They can still be changed independently and scaled independently. But then you also have this orchestration benefit where you kind of put things together. So it's almost like uh, the best of both worlds, the independence of the services, but at the same time, the, the cohesion you get uh, with the orchestrator. On the other hand, um, an orchestration service, it's something to learn and maintain. Um, and it's, it's a different way of thinking about your architecture, right? Uh, if you are used to services calling each other or if you are used to services emitting kind of events, then an orchestra orchestrator service um, is different. Um, you need to think about how to define your orchestration. You need to define, and then you need to think about where to apply your error policy. So it's a different way of thinking, uh, and it's something to, to get used to. An orchestrator can be a single point of failure. I mean, if the orchestrator is down, then nothing gets run, right? Um, so you need to be really careful. Um, and you need to make sure that you're using orchestrator uh, that's resilient and redundant. Um, you can try to do it yourself as well. Maybe you write your own orchestrator. But again, like if you do that, you need to kind of make sure that the orchestrator is solid. Otherwise, you still have this single point of failure kind of issues. And you're going to be using, uh, you're going to be losing the eventing flexibility. Um, so if you need to deploy a new service, for example, um, you you deploy your service, uh, but you also need to change your orchestrator to kind of include that service in your orchestration. So it's not so easy to extend your your architecture anymore. You need to change not only your service uh, but also your orchestration service to include that. Um, so with that, you lose a little bit of flexibility. 
and you still need to think about failed steps. So what I mean by that is that, you know, an orchestrator has multiple steps and it can make sure that those steps are successful. But at some point, if a step actually fails and, and you retry it and it's still failing, then orchestrator cannot do anything, right? It will just say, okay, the orchestration failed. Uh, and the, in an e-commerce application, for example, um, this is a problem. You, you need to define what should happen. Like, for example, if the payment step failed and you already charged the user, you need to have a compensation step to maybe uncharge the user, okay? So you need to think about like what happens if a step fails. Do I continue with the orchestration? Do I need, do, can I just quit and say, okay, I'm done uh, and everything failed? Or do I need to actually do some work to undo my steps that I did already, right? This doesn't come for free. So you still need to think about these things. I would say at least the orchestrator makes the step failure detection easier so you can see when the step fails um, easier than eventing. But how do you compensate that failure? It's still your problem. You need to think about that. All right, so choreography orchestration, which one is better? Which one should I use? Um, well, there's no right answer, right? That's a typical software engineering answer. It depends. <laughs> it depends what you want to, do, what you're trying to do um, and what kind of flexibility you need and what kind of, you know, um, order you need in your architecture. But there are certain questions I ask myself when I'm designing something. So if, uh, if, my services are not closely related. For example, my payment processor and my notification service, they are not really closely related in the sense that they don't need to know about each other. Um, and then maybe the notification service, it can also exist in other kind of transactions, right? Not just e-commerce transactions. So if you have services that are not so closely related, they don't really need to be deployed in a certain order um, and they can exist in different kind of contexts, then I think an event-driven kind of system makes sense in that case. And that's when I usually start thinking about choreography. On the other hand, if my services are actually closely related, and by, by that I mean, you know, if they're deployed usually together, and if they're deployed in a certain order, then doing that in an event-driven way doesn't really buy you much because you know, you know that this service service A has to call service B. That, that that's not gonna change. So why do it in an event-driven way. Why, why, not, why don't you make it explicit and say, okay, this is how it should be and let's put them in an orchestration. Um, and also if the services are usually deployed together, that's usually a good clue that you know, maybe orchestration is the way to go. Also, if you can dis describe your business logic, your, your flow of your app in a flow chart, then I start thinking orchestration because that flow chart, you know, it's very useful information. And if things usually flow that way in, uh, and you can describe it that way, then, you know, take that and put an orchestration usually makes sense. But as I said, like it really depends and there's no right answer. You can take an orchestration and make it event driven that, that I'm going to show you later, or you can take event driven, make an orchestration. It really depends on what you like and what kind of, flexibility you want versus what kind of order you want in your architecture. And also you can take a hybrid approach as well. So you don't have to choose, you can combine them together. Uh, in this uh, hybrid approach, you can orchestrate things together that makes sense. So if you have a number of services that usually go together, put them together in, in an orchestration. But then at the end of the orchestration, if you need to signal other services or if you need to signal other orchestrations, you can just send a message in a loosely coupled kind of way, right? So in this hybrid approach, you're kind of combining things as they make sense, and then you're letting messages handle the rest when you need to just signal other orchestrations or services. And actually, um, I think in most of the time you would do something like this anyway. You would probably have an event triggering your orchestration or your orchestration triggering an event so you kind of combine both in most, most of the time. All right, so that was a quick introduction to choreography versus orchestration. Now I want to look at the landscape in this area, look at some services and tools that we have in this area, just to let you know uh, what kind of tools exist. 
Um, and then after this, we're going to look into orchestration in more detail. Now, in terms of landscape, uh, so for event-driven kind of um, architectures, um, if you're on AWS, there's services like SQS, SNS, EventBridge, and probably more. Um, on Azure, there's EventGrid is the main thing that I found, but there's other things like EventBus and ServiceBus. Um, on Google Cloud, there's PubSub for low-level messaging, and then there's EventArc that's built on top for application-level messaging. And then, of course, there's open source projects like Kafka and PubSub and uh, RabbitMQ, um, so on and so forth. I won't go into details of these. Uh, uh, I just want to give you some names in case uh, you want to kind of explore them later. But I think all of them, they have the common kind of characteristics. They all have a message broker kind of thing uh, sitting in the background. You have the producers and consumers. Um, producing and consuming messages, and you have the different event, event types flying around. So no matter where you are, I think we have tools and services that can help, right? You don't need to kind of write your own messaging framework um, nowadays. Back in 2005, when I started, actually, one of the first products I worked after EMC at Adobe was a messaging system, on, but this was on Flash Player. Um, so the environment was different, and that's why we had to kind of implement this all this stuff on Flash. But nowadays, I think, we, well, first of all, Flash is dead. But secondly, no matter where you are, there's some kind of eventing um, project or service ready. So I don't think anyone would implement any of this. Just pick something and use. Now, in terms of orchestration, um, this is more recent uh, concept. And because of that, I, I feel like the tools are more limited. So on AWS, there's step functions. Um, from what I've seen, step functions is more about orchestrating um, Lambda functions, and are there also some AWS services as well. But it's very AWS-centric. It doesn't really let you orchestrate anything beyond AWS, as far as I can see. On Azure, there's Logic Apps, and this is a full-fledged orchestrator that includes not only orchestrating um, Azure services and, uh, and code running in Azure, but also external services, and you can include also code, external code, and things like that. So it's, it's a really... Um, full-fledged orchestrator. On Google Cloud, there's Workflows. So Workflows is the Google Cloud's um, application service or orchestrator. And there's also Cloud Composer for data orchestration, which is based on Apache Airflow. Apache Airflow is an open source project for data orchestration. Um, and then there's a version of it on Google Cloud called Cloud Composer. That's a managed version of Apache Airflow, basically. Um, so usually I tell people that you know Workflows is for um, application service orchestration, whereas Cloud Composer is for more for data pipelines and data orchestration. Of course, you can use Cloud Composer to make calls to other services too. So you can do service orchestration with Cloud Composer too. Uh, so there's some overlap between these two services, uh, but that's not the point of Cloud Composer. The point is to do data pipelines. So if you're if you are not doing big data kind of pipelines, then you wouldn't really want to use Cloud Composer. Workflows is probably an easier and better choice. And I also did a little bit of comparison between the three. Um, I know Workflows well because I work for Google, so I, I use it. Um, but I said to myself, OK, let me look at some of the features of Workflows and see how they map to step functions and Azure Logic Apps. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through this line by line. Um, but what I want to tell you as kind of like a summary is that um, so the basic features that you expect from an orchestrator, they all exist in AWS, Azure, or, work, or Google Cloud, right? So no matter where you are, you're going to have the basics of you know, how do you define an orchestration, how do you pass parameters, HTTP requests. By the way, it's, you can see that in, in step functions, you cannot even make HTTP requests. They only let you make calls to other um, AWS Lambda services, right? So that kind of limits what you can do there, at least when I checked. But you can see that the basics are there. But then as you go to um, more advanced features, then I can see that step functions really lack like the more, more of the advanced features, whereas Lo Azure Logic Apps is very quite impressive. They have pretty much everything that you would want from um, uh, an orchestrator. Uh, and one of my favorite um, features that they have is, for example, you can define your orchestration in Azure Logic Apps. And then one of your steps could be just 
some code that you want to run. So you can kind of mix and match. So you can you can do a bit of orchestration and then just insert some code, but without having to deploy the code. It's, it's part of the orchestration. So that that feature is pretty cool, I think. And then workflows is it's very close to Logic Apps. It's missing some features, but overall, um, it's it's kind of close to what Logic App provides as well. Now this is all good for cloud providers if you're on a cloud, uh, but you might be wondering what about like uh, what if I'm not on the cloud? Uh, what can I do? Um, there's actually an open source project called CNCF Serverless Workflow. Um, it started as a specification for defining workflows, uh, in, so a common specification. But now it's turning into more than a specification. Um, there's some SDKs, uh, there's some work workflow runtimes that are being written, and there's also some developer tooling that's been written um, for open source. I haven't played with it too much. I just read their documentation and just looked around a little bit um, because it didn't seem like it was ready at the time, like a few months ago. But it's something that I'm watching, uh, and I think it's it's a good good thing that we have this open source specification as the case coming up. Uh, none of the cloud providers they support it, so none of the orchestrators from cloud providers they implement this. But it's something um, maybe at some point uh, when it becomes final, maybe it will be something that they that they they implement with an existing um, services or maybe with new services. So it's something to keep in mind. All right, so that's the landscape. So hopefully that gave you some idea on what's out there. Now I want to look into Google Cloud's workflows. And again, my point here is just to show you what an orchestration service can do for you in a little bit more detail. And then we'll get into case study. And I want to kind of zoom into the case study a little bit more um, later. All right, so what is Google Cloud workflows? Um, it's a service to orchestrate and integrate other services, okay? And in terms of what you can um, orchestrate, uh, you can orchestrate the code running on Google Cloud. So whether you're running on you know, App Engine or Cloud Functions or Cloud Run, it doesn't matter. As long as it's, it's public, um, it can be part of your orchestration. Um, you can include Google APIs in your orchestration. So any Google Cloud APIs like Vision API or BigQuery, or even Google APIs like Gmail, Hangouts. So any kind of, again, public API or any API that can be called from Google Cloud can be part of your orchestration. And external APIs as well. So if you want to include, let's say, the Twitter API or the you know, SendGrid API or something like that in your orchestration, you can include those too. Um, and I like this because in an orchestration, usually it's not about just your code running or it's not just calling the APIs within the cloud, but it's actually a combination of all, right? Your code, the APIs that you're calling, and also the external APIs that you're calling. So Workflows allows you to kind of combine all of this into an orchestration, basically. And how do you define this orchestration? Um, there's a workflow definition language, and it's YAML or JSON based. Here I'm showing a YAML example. And you know, if you go back to our simple example from before, um, we had the payment processor running on Cloud Run, which is a container service. Then we have the Cloud Function Shipper, and we have the Notifier, again, Cloud Run. So you can see they are calling each other. So if you want to, uh, take, if you want to model this in an orchestration, what you do is you, you first define the steps. So over here, we are defining three steps, process payment, ship items, and notify user. And then in each step, you define what happens. So in process payment, we are doing an HTTP post call to this URL, which is the Cloud Run URL. And we are passing in this um, input in the body that we received from the previous step. So this payment details we received as an argument, and we are passing in as an input to, the, to this step. Now, what, this call is going to be made by workflows. Once the call is made, you get the result back. And this result we capture as process result, right? And then in the next step, we are again making an HTTP post. Uh, this time we are calling the cloud function. So as you can see, it can be any kind of URL. And the input is the body of the process result. So the result that we received from the previous uh, step, we take that, we parse the body. So there's a simple JSON parsing here. Uh, and then we pass that as an input. So that's that's how you define your orchestration. And this, this is how workflows knows how to call things in what order and what to do with the inputs, what to do with the outputs, and so on and so forth. So the main features are step sequencing. So you know, setting up this kind of sequence steps 
of course, you can set much more complicated steps than this, but um, that's the that's the main feature. Uh, you can do something like serverless pause. So let's say the shipping function, for example, after you ship, you want to pause a little bit before you notify the user. So you can add a pause in your step uh, for up to like I think pause. I think you can wait for like a year or so. Uh, so you can add any, as much pause as you want uh, before you do the next step. And I already mentioned this, uh, you can pass um, variables between steps and you can do simple JSON parsing um, in, in your orchestration. So you don't have to, when you receive a response, you don't need to call code to parse step. You can kind of do a little bit of parsing of that within your orchestration. Uh, you can apply um, error and read write policies in, for each step. So for example, here, let's say, you want to make sure that the payment processor um, is called multiple times in case of an error. You can say, for this step, I want to call five times max, but I want to do this in an exponential back off kind of way, right? So I don't want to keep doing it in a loop, but I would rather do it and wait a little bit and then do it again. Uh, so this policy can be applied at the step level uh, without you having to do it in the code, which makes it really easy. Um, and then, Let's say your shipping function can can be successful or not. Um, you can capture those uh, code, those so the HTTP codes, for example, and say if I receive the success HTTP code, then I'm gonna call this notifier service. Otherwise, if I received an error kind of code, then I'm gonna call this pager service, right? So that kind of stuff, branching basically depending on what happened, can be done as part of your orchestration instead of again doing it in the code. You can do conditionals. So let's say you read some value from a DB and you want to check if it's more than zero or less than, or zero or less. So this auto stop check, normally we do this kind of stuff in the code, but if it's simple enough, you can do it in the YAML, <laughs> basically just say, okay, is this out of stock or not? And if so, do different branches in your orchestration. And the third party calls, they're just another URL call in your, from your step, so that, that's also very easy to do. And finally, uh, you can create sub workflows. Um, so have a workflow. If you have a workflow that you call from multiple places, you can put that in a sub workflow um, to encapsulate it and then call it from multiple places. Uh, there's connectors to call other Google Cloud services. Um, these connectors are really useful um, because, for example, if you want to, let's say, create a virtual machine on, on any cloud, first, what you need to do is that you need to submit, you know, create the virtual machine. But then that, that's a long running operation, right? Like it's, you're going to submit it. It will take some time to, up and, to get up and, up and running. And in that meantime, what you need to do is you need to kind of wait and you need to kind of, in a loop, check if the VM is up and running, actually, right? That's how you know that the, the event is actually successful. But the connectors uh, kind of do this logic for you. So you can use Google Cloud's Compute Engine connector, and that will you know, create the VM, and it will wait for it um, before telling you that it's created. So that kind of stuff uh, becomes really easy if, if you use connectors. And there are other things like iterations. So let's say you want to call um, the Twitter API and get like 1,000 results back, and then iterate on those results um, and do something, right? You can do four loops, basically, in your orchestration. Um, if you want to include people in your orchestration, you have callbacks so that you know in one step, maybe you make a callback. Uh, in one step, it, it, that goes to a human, and then the human might hit a button, and that will call back to your, to your orchestration. So that way, you can include like people in the loop, basically, if you like. And uh, to deploy a workflow, um, Define your YAML and just deploy. This doesn't run it, it just deploys it. And then to run it, you have to execute it. And then you can see the results by describing it. So it's very easy. And then there's also a UI um, to do the, all of this from the UI. Um, and what I like about the UI is that you, know, you define your orchestration and then you can see your orchestration. So you see the flowchart in a way uh, here. And um, this really makes it easy to kind of visualize what's happening. And I'm going to show an example of this uh, in the last 15 minutes that we have. All right, so that was, again, another quick one. Um, so just to give you an idea on what to expect from workflows. But now let's talk about this case study, because I think 
this is kind of the most useful part of the talk um, to learn from this case study. Uh, so me and my coworker, Guillaume, uh, we wrote an app called Piccadilly. Um, it's a picture sharing app um, that we wrote for a customer in London. So that's why we call it Piccadilly to combine picture sharing and Piccadilly Circus in London. That's like a, the name. Um, and this um, app, what it does is that you, you would upload pictures in this app. And once you upload the pictures, we use machine learning to detect if this um, picture, what this picture is about. So we detect the labels out of this picture. And we also de detect the dominant color in this picture. So you see this border around this picture. We also de detect that using machine learning. Um, and then we also have a collage where we combine the four mo most recent pictures, right? So the four most recent pictures, we put them in a collage. So basically, user, user upload a picture. We use machine learning to extract the labels, extract the dominant color, and display them like this. And we also create a collage out of these pictures. Now, initially, we implement this, implemented this app using an event-driven architecture. And this architecture looked like this. So we have the users uploading an image to a front end on App Engine. This goes to a cloud storage bucket. It's a place to save any kind of files. And once the image is saved, this fires off a number of events. Now, first event goes to a cloud function. Um, this runs Vision API to analyze the picture and store the labels and the color in Firestore, which is a NoSQL database. Now, the second event goes to a thumbnail service, which is a cloud run service that runs a container. Um, and you can see that this goes through PubSub, the, the Google Cloud's uh, messaging service. And the reason for that is because there is no direct connection from Cloud Storage to Cloud Run, like, like there is for Cloud Functions. So we had to go through PubSub. And this creates a smaller version of the image and saves the image back to the bucket. Then we have another service called Collage Service that runs on a schedule. So it's triggered by a scheduler and goes and fetches the four most recent pictures and creates a collage. And finally, we have a garbage collection service, uh, another Cloud Run service that receives the image deletion uh, events. So when an image is deleted, it deletes the thumbnail of the image, but and it also deletes the met metadata of the image from Firestore. And this, this goes through event arc um, because when we first initially implemented Cloud Run, there was no event arc, so we had to use PubSub. But then the, when the image garbage collection service came along, then there's this new messaging service called event arc that, that's easier to use, so we use that. Um, so you can see in this event-driven architecture, everything is loosely coupled. No service calls it the, the next service. They don't know about each other. And we have different kinds of events flying around. So we have the event flying from here to Cloud Functions, which is a, which is a direct event. We have this pops up events. We have this event arc cloud events. And finally, we have this scheduling events, right? And this was already becoming kind of complicated, even though it's a simple kind of app. Uh, for example, if something kind of failed, we would not know where it failed. We would just start trying to hunt uh, each service logs and see where things failed. And also, the I mentioned these different event formats. Um, so the cloud function, for example, would receive the event like this uh, directly, whereas the the thumbnail service will receive a pop-up message that has the data field that's basics before encoded that will, and by decoding it, we'll get the actual file event. So there was like multiple levels of um, uh, events, basically, that we had to sort through. And then the garbage collection service would get a, yet another event type called a cloud event. Um, that's through audit logs, because that's how we had event at work at the time. And then from the cloud event and within the audit log, we would get the actual bucket and, and file name, right? So you can see that already we are dealing with three different event formats, and it becomes kind of complicated to think about, okay, which service is this? What kind of event it's receiving? What kind of event it wants to send out? Can we use PubSub? Can we use event art? Can we use direct events? That kind of stuff. Now, at the beginning of this year, um, workflows became GA, and we said to ourselves, okay, why don't we take this event-driven um, architecture and try to convert it into an orchestrated architecture, okay? And this is what we came up with. Um, when you first look at this, you're probably thinking, 
this looks actually more complicated, right? Like, what, what is, where is the benefit? But actually, everything in the red boxes, uh, it's one service, it's workflows service. So if you think of this as one service, then it actually is a simpler architecture. And the way this works is that um, we have users, again, uploading images to the front end. It, could, it goes to the cloud storage bucket. Um, then that triggers an event. So it's still event-driven in that sense. Um, and then that event goes to a cloud function. And then the cloud function now starts the orchestration. So it will basically make a call to workflows um, to run the orchestration. By the way, we had to do this because there was no way to connect cloud storage events to workflow directly. So that's why we had to have this cloud function in the middle. But actually, right now, we don't even need this. We can just route this directly to workflows without a cloud function in the middle. But uh, maybe we'll change that later. So now we receive this event. And now at this point, we are in workflows. Workflows looks at the event type, and it says, OK, is this object deletion? And if so, it deletes the, object, deletes the image um, thumbnail, and it also deletes the image's metadata from the Firestore. So this happens within workflows with no external services. Then if it's a new, new um, kind of um, uh, new, new file, then we call the workflows calls Vision API, and then it gets the data back. We transform the data in a cloud function. Then we check if the image is safe or not using Vision API again. Then we store the metadata of the image to Firestore. And then we make a call to thumbnail service to get the smaller version of the image. And we make a call to the collage service to create a collage of the service. Now you can see that in this model, some of the work happens within the orchestration, right? The orchestrator is the one doing the work. And some of the work happens by delegating to an external service, right? So you can kind of pick and choose what happens um, within workflows and what happens um, externally and just call that service. And actually, uh, let me see, um, I can show you this application. So here, I'm, I am, the application is running right now. And let's actually upload a picture and see if it works. So I'm just going to choose a file, pictures, and choose my, my picture. And let's hit Submit. And now the orchestrator is running. So if I go to Google Cloud Console and look at workflows, I can see that there's a um, daily workflows. So let's click on that. You can see that there's executions. And actually, this just ran now. So it's already done. But let's look at the source first. So my um, source is, um, this is the source of the orchestration. And um, I don't know if you can see, uh, maybe I can make this a little bit bigger. But basically, you can see that it's receiving an argument. This argument is the event that it receives. From there, we pick the file and the bucket of the event. Then we check what kind of event this is. So we are doing a conditional check here. Uh, and if it's not, if the event is not supported, we say okay, the event is not supported. Otherwise, we say okay, let's call the image analysis first. Then let's tra transform the image, check the safety, store the metadata, so on and so forth. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but you can see like we we have this nice nice visualization where we say okay, I do the event type switch. Then I if it's this one, then I do my image analysis, check safety, um, and final is complete, right? So that's very useful. Um, if you look at executions, you can see that it executed. And we can see that this is the input of the execution. So we can see that this was an event type um, finalized. And then the output as well. For the output, I'm capturing the HTTP code from each service that I called and just returning that. But you can return whatever you want. We can see the logs here uh, of what happened. And if we um, if you go back, you can look at the logs. Yeah, if there's triggers, uh, how to connect your workflows, you can look at it here. And actually, if we go back here, if I, if I do refresh, I should see my picture. It's already labeled with, with the thing. So it's already uh, out there. So you can see um, how, how it works uh, in workflows. Um, let me go back to my presentation. In the last five minutes, I just want to cover uh, what we kind of learned from this transformation of you know, changing it from event-driven to orchestration. Uh, first of all, um, I show you the three different different eventing formats that we had to deal with before, right? Uh, it's not too complicated, but at the same time, it was getting already confusing. Um, with workflows, we could switch to basically just doing pure HTTP calls. 
right? So from three different eventing formats, we went to like pure HTTP post calls, basically. And that was quite refreshing, right? Having to deal with something like HTTP that everyone knows and understands is, is quite refreshing. Secondly, uh, definitely we got rid of a bunch of code. So we all the event parsing code was gone. We don't have to parse events anymore. We still have to parse the body of the HTTP, uh, but at least we don't have to parse the envelope around it, like with all these events. Um, we could get rid of all the image analysis um, function because the workflow can make that for us, it can make that call for us, so we don't need an external service. The garbage collection collector service, we can also get rid of as well um, because the workflow was deleting the service for us. So overall, we had less code and also less setup, right? It's not just about code, but it's actually the setup that you need for your services. So we didn't have to set up pops up, we didn't have to set up class schedule, we didn't have to set up event arc anymore. So instead of three different kind of services, we could just use uh, workflows. So we had to learn just one workflow and just use that instead of three different services. And the error handling was really easy this time because if something failed, you mean we would see right away that it failed in this step. And we could just go to that step and look at the service, right? Um, the whole chain stops basically. So we don't have to second guess now where things failed. Now, in terms of disadvantages, um, the workflow service is a something, something new to learn for us. So we always were wondering, okay, if I want to make this HTTP call, how can I make it? If there's authentication, how do you set up authentication? Um, how do you do things in YAML, you know? Um, so there's a lot of things that you need to kind of understand and learn, but that's just true for any kind of service, but you need to understand that it's a, it's a neat thing with certain limitations that you, that you might not be aware of from before. Um, we constantly have this dilemma between code versus YAML because the good thing about um, workflows is that you can define your steps and you can do things in YAML, uh, so you can make a call to a service and get the result and do things in YAML. But then YAML is not a coding language, right? It's, it's not even, it's more like a configuration language. And at some point we were thinking, okay, should we do this in YAML or should we just break out an external service and do it in, in the code and just call that service? And there's no straight answer. Uh, but I guess as a rule of thumb, I would say if something is easy enough to do in YAML, just do it in YAML because you don't need to deal with an external service. But if it gets out of hand, then trying to then do it in, in the code and then just call the code. So that's what we did. And also workflows um, has this single YAML file um, that you need to deploy, uh, which makes it quite kind of, it gets out of hand quite easily because if you have something complicated, then it's a single YAML file. Although you can use Terraform to break it into multiple YAMLs and kind of combine them um, using Terraform if you like. You know, debugging, testing, um, well, I, I should take out logging because logging is good now in workflows, but debugging and testing is not that great right now uh, because you, you basically need to just deploy the workflow and see if it works or not. There's no way to locally debug it or locally test it. Um, we are working on that uh, to make it um, more debuggable and testable, but it's not like code, for example, where you, you can kind of write, write unit tests for it, right? Um, so in that sense, it's less debuggable and testable. And there's no IDE support. Like, ideally, you would open Visual Studio Code or something and just look at your YAML and see, get some hints and things like that. No such support yet, but hopefully it will be there. And with orchestration, you lose a little bit of parallelism, right? Because in eventing, everything happens in parallel. You just fire events and things happen in parallel. Whereas in orchestration, we, we take steps from one step to next step. Uh, so it's not parallel, it's step by step. Um, it wasn't an issue for us because in our case, things are really quick, but if you are doing a lot of step, steps that might take long, um, they are not being done in parallel, so you need to keep that in mind. Yeah, I think that's it, and we are almost out of time. So if you want to learn more about workflows, it's here. Um, this Picadale application actually is part of a workshop um, of, of six labs. And it's all open source, it's already out there. So this is the link for the workshop and this is the link for the code. So if you want to build this up yourself um, or just look at the code and how things are set up, feel free, um, it's out there. Um, and if you have any questions or anything like that, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter and I'll be happy to answer. So yeah, thanks a lot for listening. Hopefully it was useful to you. And if you have Q,
questions, I'll be happy to answer them later. Yeah, th thank you, Meta. That was that was great. I I took a bunch of notes more than I expected. I've got to figure out how to organize that later now. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I learned a lot. Um, I actually had a lot of questions through it. You wound up answering many of them um, as, as you went went through. Um, so I'd be interested, especially to hear what questions, uh, some of our other attendees, attendees, uh, here have had, um, I did one of the things at, at the end, I want to see if you just had a, 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 a moment to clarify on that, yeah. uh, that parallelism and the potential loss of parallelism. It seems like there are certain circumstances in where, you know, maybe that's a, you know, as you, you mentioned, you, you did mention, it's not necessarily, you know, one method to rule them all here that, you know, orchestration is going to trump every use of, you know, choreography. Um, but I wonder, it, could that be a tipping point some of the time? Is the need for parallelism or perhaps, as you had previously answered one of my questions here that I was writing down, perhaps that's where some of the hybrid approach would step in? Yeah, if I parallelism mean, so is important. right now, if, if you're using Google Cloud Workflows, everything is step by step. So yeah, if parallelism is important, then yeah, basically eventing is the way to go. But um, there's a feature that's being worked on in workflows uh, that will make things parallel. So for example, uh, let's say you make a call to, again, Twitter, Twitter API, get a bunch of tweets, and then you want to, in a for loop, um, process those, those, right? But you want to do them in parallel because they don't need to be done one by one. They're, they're not de depending on each other. There's a feature that's been worked on to do that in parallel. So it's coming. Uh, and when, it, when that comes, like you will be able to do things in parallel. But as of today, yes, I mean, if that kind of thing is important to you, like parallelism, um, you can't do that right now. What about parallelism to perhaps do two different things with an outcome? Um, would, is, that, is that also something that would be developed? Or is that where you perhaps you would generate different events? Um, yeah, uh, you go to different yeah, I mean, systems to process those? Right, yeah. I mean, I, I think the way they're designing the parallelism in workflows is that um, you will basically be able to say, I want to do this in in different branch, basically, and then what what that branch is, you define what it is, and it will be done, basically, well, not in the main orchestrator, but like, in a separate branch, like ah. in parallel. So you, you get to define what that is. It can be the same thing with different data, or it can be even like a call to a sub workflow that does something completely different, you know? Very interesting. A again, thank you so much for your presentation. It's got me thinking about where we might want to adapt different things, uh, especially since you didn't tell us everyone should switch to this. <laughs> you made it conditional. That's going to make us all, all think through where we might want to adapt this. I don't, um, I'm interested to see if we have a number of questions. I know we have a discussion forum set up afterwards. Um, so, uh, you know, from me again, thank you very much. And I hope to see many of you uh, in the chat. Meta, would you like cool. to? Thanks for having me.